Good day, grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson on probability. In fact, we're only going to do two more questions on probability using exam paper type questions. This is the first one. And then after that, what we are going to do is we're going to start working through paper one revision because we've actually finished all the content for grade 12 maths. And I think that the best way to prepare for finals then is to go through as many old exam paper questions that we can find. So we will be doing that. Um, okay, so it says find the number of different arrangements for the letters triple D, triple, double E, F and G, if all seven letters must be used and there are no restrictions. In other words, when they say there are no restrictions, it means that we can put them in any order that we want. Okay, so remember what we did, we learned about this. Okay, first of all, it says there are seven letters. So we've got seven factorial, but we have to take into account that we've got three Ds and we've got two E's. So we have to take into account that we can repeat those and that would make a difference. It would reduce the number of options that we have. So that's what we do. We divide by three factorial and then we divide by two factorial. And obviously we could divide by one factorial and one factorial, but that's stupid because one factorial is just one. So we divide them by one, which is stupid. Okay, so therefore we've got seven factorial divided by three factorial, two factorial. Why the three? Because these three here reduce the number of options and these two reduce the number of options as well. So if we think about this, it could be written as seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. Three factorial is three times two times one and two factorial is times two times one. So therefore we can say, okay, well this is pretty easy. Three times two times one is going to cancel with three times two times one. Obviously one doesn't count, but seven, two goes into four twice. So therefore we can go seven times six times five times two. Obviously I'm very happy for you to put this all in your calculator. I'm just showing you how you could do this um, without the use of a calculator. And the reason I'm doing this guys is because in your NBTs they actually ask you about factorials and they expect you to be able to cancel the factorials like this and, and not use a calculator because your NBTs you aren't allowed to use a calculator. So then it would just be, if we clear this, it would be 7 times 6 times 5 times 2, which equals 420. So that means that there are 420 different ways that we could uh, rearrange these seven letters. And you'll notice that it significantly decreases um, the number of combinations if you've got triple Ds and double Es, etc. Okay, let's do one more question. I want to do this one. It's a nice Venn diagram question with including it some probability. Okay, so it says a local club has facilities that include tennis courts and a golf course. So there's tennis courts and a golf course. Okay, it says a survey of the club members indicate that 72% regularly use the golf club golf course. Okay, so let's write this down. 72% use the golf course. That doesn't mean exclusively, they just mean that they do. And 48%, 48% regularly use the tennis course. Um, tennis court. Okay. Now it says some members regularly use both. Okay, while well, 8% use neither. So 8% use neither the tennis or the golf. And the club has got 700 members. The club has got 700 members. Members. Um, and obviously we need to change these fractions into whatever. So instead of 8% there, I'm just going to erase that 8. Oh, I hate when it doesn't change. Erase that 8% there. And think about it this way. We know that 8%, what the heck? 8%. Um, don't play, do not do golf or tennis. Okay, now it says the club has 700 members. There's a total of 700 members here. It says determine the number of members that regularly use at least one of the facilities. You may find this Venn diagram useful. Okay, so do you agree that First of all, let's work out how many people don't play anything. So that would mean that we have, and let's change them into numbers, in other words. Let's change these into numbers. Um, uh, 
I'm just thinking if we really want to change this into numbers or if we actually just can, yeah, no, let's change it into numbers. Okay, so now let's keep it in percentages. So we're going to keep it in percentages and then we'll combine, find the answer in the end. So this is 8%, okay, which is, and the 700 is equal to 100%, okay? Now it says we've got 72% regularly use the golf course. Okay, so all of this has to equal 72%, okay? And 48% use their tennis court. So all of this has to be 48%. So what we can do is we can let the percentage of the people that use both be X. Then do you agree the people who just play golf are going to be 72 minus X? And the people who just play tennis are going to be 48 minus X. Okay, so therefore we can say that in total we've got 48 minus X plus X plus 72 minus X plus 8 has to equal to 100. Okay, do you understand that? Let me show you in another way. Let me just circle this. Of all the people playing tennis, 48% of them play tennis. That all has to be, okay? X of them play both tennis and golf. Therefore, the rest has to be 48 minus X. Similarly, if I look at this circle here, I've got 72% of them that play golf. But if X of them play both, then the people that just play golf themselves is 72 minus X. So this plus this plus this plus this has to equal to 100%. So if we add that up, those go away. And we end up with 72 and 8 is 80. So we've got 80 plus 48 minus X is going to equal 100. I'm sorry, I'm going to change color now. I don't like this green. So that becomes 128 minus X is equal to 100. Therefore, X is going to be 28%. So now we know that 28% of people just play, uh, play both, play both. Of those, okay, then because of that, 48 minus 28, we've got 20% pay just tennis, and we've got 72 minus 28, oof, 72 minus 28, that's a 4, that's a 6, that becomes a 4 as well. Okay, so that becomes 44% just play golf. Okay, so now... What is the question? It says determine the number of members that regularly use at least one of these facilities. At least one of these facilities. Um, so in other words, we want to know just this bit here. They need to play, they need to use either the tennis or the golf. So we're looking for the intersection, which is the 28%. Yes, the 28%. So it's going to be 28% of 700 so we need a calculator so we say 0.28 multiplied by 700 equals 196 people so of that 196 people play at least tennis or golf okay right then it says, suppose we randomly select a member of the club. What is the probability that this person uses exactly and only one facility? Okay, so they're either going to use the tennis or they're going to use the golf. Okay, so therefore the probability is going to be the 20%, okay, which is an be the 20% of the tennis added to the 44% of the um, golf, I mean multiplied by. So now let me put it to you another way. We've got 20% of 700 is what? Let's work that out. Um, point, no, let's try again. I see. Point 0.2 times 700. Okay, so that's 140. So 140 out of 700 people 
play tennis and only tennis. And then you've got 44%. So we've got 0.44 times 700 is going to be 308 people. And then you've got 308 people over the 700 that play golf. Okay, do you understand that? So now if we look at that, what can we tell about that? What can we tell? We can say, well, in that case, we've got 308 plus the 140 all over the 700. Okay, and that's going to give us the statistical ratio of what exactly is going to be the chances that they'll only play one. So 308 plus 140 works out to be 448 over 700. And then if I then divide both the top and the bottom, I get that to be 16 over 25. Um, and if I times that by 4, it becomes 0.64. So the probability that only one person, that person uses only one facility, in other words, they either use the tennis or the golf, is going to be 0.64. Okay, now it says the probability used in the golf course and the probability times multiplied by the probability used in the tennis court is 0.72 minus 0.48. They gave us those numbers, it's nothing special. That so becomes 0.346. Now it says validate statistically whether these events are independent or not. Okay, so in order for them to be independent, okay, the probability of the tennis intersected with the golf has to be equal to the probability of the tennis multiplied by the probability of the golf. But as you can see, we've already worked out that the probability of um, the tennis and sectored with the golf is 28%, which is 0.28. And the probability of these two multiplied was given as 0.34. Therefore, we can say that they are not independent. They are not independent. For them to be independent, these have to be equal. Okay, so that is our probability section. We will obviously do more probability questions as we come across them in the exams, the final exams um, that we're going to be going through. But at the moment, what I'd like to do is start with some very basic exam revision. So all I've done is copied out a whole bunch of questions from the March 2015 um, paper. It is obviously the supplementary paper, the national one. And it's a very good paper. It's a high quality. If you guys want to go through question papers that are slightly more difficult, then always choose the supplementary papers. I know it's ridiculous, um, but it's true that the supplementary papers tend to be harder than the end of the year papers. And I think the logic behind it is that they don't want children or students to think, oh, well, if I don't study for this now and I don't get it right, I can just write this up. Okay. First of all, obviously, you need to have a good reason to write this up. Um, um, you can't just decide that you just didn't feel like writing that day. And secondly, they I think they also think that since you've writing this up, you've had three extra more months to write, to study for it. So 90% of the time, the supplementary exam or 99% of the exam time, the supplementary exam is more difficult than the end of the year paper. Okay, so let's factorize this. So let's solve for x. We've got x squared minus x minus 20. So if we factorize this, we need to, obviously this is x and this is x because the pref the number in front of this is just a 1. Okay, now we need to look at the factors of 20. So obviously it's 1 and 20, it's 2 and 10, it's 5 and 4. We want there to be a difference of 1 between the numbers. So it's obviously not that one and it's not that one. This minus tells me that the signs are different and this minus tells me that the big one is the negative. So it's x minus 5 x plus 4. So let's work that out. 5 times 4 is 20. Yes. Minus 5 plus 4 is minus 1. Yes, it works. Therefore, x is equal to 5 or x is equal to minus 4. Nice, easy question to start with. Hey? Right, now it says solve for x and then they say correct to two decimal places. Guys, if they say correct to two decimal places, what must you use? You must use the formula x is equal to minus b 
plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, so you obviously don't need to memorize it because it is on your formula sheet, but you do need to know how to use it. So remember that this here is a, the whole of this, including the minus, is b, and this is c. Okay, so what x is equal to minus b, so it's going to be minus minus 11 plus or minus the square root of b squared is going to be minus 11 squared minus 4 times by 2 times by 7 all over 2 times by 2. Okay, so minus times minus plus it's 11. Plus plus square root of 11 squared is 132. Yeah. No, it's not. It's 121. Shame. <sighs> Sorry, I'm irritated myself. 121 minus uh, 4 sevens are 28 times by 2 is 56. All over 4. And at this point, okay, so it's 11 plus or minus the square root of. And at this point, I think I would get out my calculator. Okay, in fact, I would get it out before this. So let's go through it. It's going to be 11 plus the square root of 121 minus 56 equals divided by 4 equals, that doesn't help at all, does it? So it becomes 7 point, um, 4 point seven seven because it says to two decimal places, which means we have to look at the third one. This 5 is making this has to round up, so it becomes 4.77. So the answer is 4 comma 7 7 or okay, I'm just going to cross it out now we need to do it exactly the same way but we need to get the minus so we're going to go up and we're going to go up no we're going to go up and then we're going to go back and then we're going to go delete we're going to go minus and say equals and it becomes that which is useless to me 2.94 or 2,94. So it's actually quite an easy question. You must just remember that you need to round off to two decimal places. Okay, now they've asked us to solve 5x squared plus 4 is greater than 21x. So I'm hoping you guys will realize that we've got x squared, x and a normal number. So this is a trinomial or quadratic. And we need to take everything on the one side of the inequality sign. So we've got 5x squared minus 21x plus 4 is greater than 0. Okay, it really doesn't matter if you took it the other side, it's fine. Now remember also, whenever you see an inequality, you must draw a number line. I don't know what the numbers are going to be yet. I'm just drawing the number line so that I know that I'm going to be using it. Okay. Now we need to factorize this. So the factors of 5 are 5 and 1. The factors of 4 are 4 and 1, 1 and 4 and 2 and 2. This plus tells me that both signs in the brackets are going to be the same and they both can be minus and I want minus 21. So 5 times 1 is 5 and 4 times 1 is 4. No matter what you do, you're not going to get 21. So it can't be that. 5 times 5 is 20 and 1 times 1 is 21. That there is going to be my answer. So we've got 5 and 1 and 1 and 4. We need it to be minus 21, so it has to be both of them have to be negative. So it becomes 5x minus 1, x minus 4, okay, is greater than 0. So now, if we think about this, our values are 5x minus 1, our benchmarks, our markings, where it is, it's going to be equal to 0. Therefore, x is going to be a fifth, or x is going to equal 4. Again,
my apologies, I don't know what happened there. Um, anyway, so what we were doing, we said that this value, oh, sorry, we said that this value here is going to be one fifth, and that value there is going to be four. And at those points, this expression, the whole expression is going to be equal to zero. If x is a fifth, this will equal to zero, and then zero times that is going to be zero. And if this x equals four, then you've got zero times this, which equals zero. Okay, now we want to find out where this works. Okay, now I know that some of you might know this trick where you go, well, this is obviously a happy parabola, and then you draw this. Okay, and then you go, well, obviously then, this is going to be greater than zero from here onwards and from here onwards. And that is a wonderful way to do it if this thing is a parabola. However, if this is not a parabola, then you're a little bit screwed. You're a little bit can't do this, okay, because of the fact that it won't work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the way that I would do it if this was not a parabola. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a number smaller than one fifth. So I'm going to choose zero. Okay, and I'm going to substitute zero into both the brackets. And I don't care about the actual number, I care about whether the bracket is a minus or a positive. Okay, so I'm choosing the number zero. So five times zero is zero, minus one is negative. Zero minus four is negative, and negative times a negative is a positive. Okay. Now let's choose a number between one fifth and four. I don't know. Let's choose one. Five times one is five. Minus one is positive. One minus four is minus. So plus times a minus is a minus. Now we're going to choose a number bigger than four. Let's choose five. Five times five is 25. Minus one is positive. Five minus four is positive. So that becomes a positive. So you can see again, we get exactly the same answer because there's nothing wrong with what we did earlier. It's just limiting if this is not a quadrilateral trinomial. Okay, so now we need to write this down. So it's going to be x is greater than four or x is smaller than one fifth. And there you go. Please, guys, remember to do your number line. There are marks allocated for the number line. Okay, now it says solve for x. So we've got 2 to the 2x minus 6 times 2 to the x is equal to 16. Okay, so let's just rewrite this as 2 to the 2x minus 6 times 2 to the x minus 16 equals 0. Now this looks quite tricky and I know that some of you might think, well, I've got to take out a common factor of 2 to the x and then I'm left with 2 whatever squared, da, da, da. It's just terrible, okay? But if you realize that we can say let k equal 2 to the x, then k squared would equal what? It would equal 2 to the x all squared, which is going to be 2 to the 2x. And then we use that, we substitute in, we go, well, 2 to the 2x is therefore k squared, minus 6k, minus 16 equals naught. So now let's see if we can solve for k, because if we can solve for k, then we can get out our x. So we end up with a k and a k. Our factors of 16 are 1 and 16, 4 and 4, and 8 and 2. And we want a difference of six. So that's not going to happen. That's going to happen. This is going to work. So it's going to have to be minus eight plus two. So it's k minus eight, k plus two. Therefore, k is equal to minus two or k is equal to eight. Okay, but what is k? k is two to the x. So k, okay, so you have minus two is equal to two to the x. Okay. Or... 2 to the x is equal to 8. Um, I just want to check that I'm right about this. Yeah. So obviously that's not possible. There's no solution to that. But yeah, x is going to equal 3. Ta-da! And there you go. Right. Now let's do this simultaneously. Okay. x plus 1 equals 2x. Okay. Now 
I know that you get taught three ways to solve these things simultaneously, but guys, you really need to decide what's the easiest for you guys. And unless they say solve for X and Y simultaneously by using elimination or whatever, you can do it any way you want. And actually, I think in the curriculum, all they require is for you to solve it simultaneously, whichever way you prefer. So we've got two equations here. You've got y plus one is equal to two x, and x squared minus xy plus y squared is equal to seven. So obviously we need to choose something to solve for in equation one. I'm going to call this equation one and this equation two. Okay, so you could solve for x, but then what would happen? You'd end up with y plus one over two is equal to x. And then you'd have to substitute, whenever you saw x here, you'd have to substitute that in, which would be horrible. So, a better, what is going on? A better solution is to solve for y. Okay, so here's the tip. Always try and solve for the quick, the variable that isn't going to result in a fraction if possible. So y is going to be just 2x minus 1. And we're going to call this equation 3, and we're going to take 3 and sub it into equation 2. Okay, so if we see a y, we now need to write 2x minus 1. So we've got x squared minus x times by 2x minus 1 plus 2x minus 1 all squared is equal to 7. So we end up with x squared minus 2x squared minus times minus is a plus x plus, and now we need to multiply this out. So it becomes 2x squared is 4x squared minus 2x and then minus 2x again is minus 4x plus 1 is equal to 7. Right, so let's join up all the things. So x squared minus 2x squared is minus x squared plus x plus 4x squared minus 4x plus 1 equals 0. So minus x squared plus 4x squared is 3x squared plus x minus 4x is, that's not 0, it's 7, plus x minus 4x is minus 3x, and then plus 1 minus 7 is minus 6 is equal to 0. So do you agree that I can happily take out a common factor of a 3, and you're left with x squared minus x minus 2 equals 0, that cancels. So you're left with x minus 2, x plus 1 equals 0. Therefore, x is equal to 2 or x is equal to minus 1. Have we finished the sum, grade 12s? No, we haven't. Please understand we haven't finished because now we need to substitute that x equals 2 into either of the equations, the originals, or anything that's derived from the originals and then find the values of y. So if you look, we can see that we got, we used y might equals 2x minus 1, so therefore we can say y equals 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 3, or y is equal to 2 times negative 1 minus 1, which is minus 2 minus 1, which is minus 3. So therefore your final answer, and you always need to put it in coordinates so that they match, is going to be 2, 3, or minus one, minus three. You always have to write them as coordinates. You can't just randomly write x equals two, x equals minus one, and then y equals three and y equals minus three, and they don't know which belong to each other. You have to, have to, have to always match them up. Okay, now we have to do roots. Okay, now remember what we said about roots. Roots are basically a way for us to talk about the nature of products, I mean, nature of the equation and the graph. In other words, whether it's a happy graph, whether it's a sad graph, has it been shifted over, has it been shifted up, etc. So that's what our roots give us, okay? Okay, so it says the roots of the quadratic equation are given by x is equal to minus 5 plus or minus the square root of 20 plus 8k over 6 where k is an element of minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. 
Huh. It says write down two values of k for which the roots will be rational. Okay, so we need to remember the rational roots. Rational roots or rational numbers are numbers that can be written as a fraction. Okay. Um, and non-real non-real non roots. Non-real roots are going to be um, negative, okay, within the square root. Okay, non-real roots, I'll show you. Okay, so do you remember that we're actually talking here about delta? And everything inside this square root here is the delta value, okay? So this here is the same as our delta. And that's what we really need to work on because we know that for rational roots, for the rational roots, what does delta have to be? Delta has to be greater than or equal to zero because that is the only way that you can write this as a fraction. Yeah. So let's have a look at this. So basically we want 20 plus 8k has to be, in fact, delta plus 20k has to equal zero. Okay, 20, 20 delta plus 8k has to equal zero. And I'll tell you why, because we need the roots to be rational or it has to be a perfect square or, or it has to be a perfect square. Okay, so let's think about this. If we substitute this in, we get k is going to be minus 20 over 8. And you'll notice that that's not going to work because none of these is going to give you is, is that value. Okay, so that doesn't work. But if this is a perfect square, then you end up with minus 5 plus or minus another legitimate number divided by 6 and you end up with a rational root. Okay, so that is what we need to do. We need to find out which of these is going to give this, make this a perfect square. So if we go 20 plus 8 times minus 3, what do we end up with? We get 20 plus 8 times 3 is minus 24, so we end up with minus 4. Okay, because 20 minus 24 is negative 4. So that's not going to work. What about minus 2? 20 plus 8 times minus 2 is 20 minus 16, which is 4. That would work. Yay. Then we've got 20 minus 1. So it's 20 plus 8 times by minus 1, which is going to be 12. That's not going to work. Naught would just be 20. So that's not going to work. 20 plus 8 is 28. That's not going to work. 20 plus 16 is 36, so that's going to work because 36, the square root of 36 is 6. And 20 plus 8 times 3 is 24. 24 plus 20 is 44, that's not going to work. So the only, it says write down two values of k, which is the root, so rational. It is going to be at minus 2 and at 2. At those two points, the roots are going to be rational. Now it says write down one value of k for which the roots will be non-real. In other words, for the roots to be non-real, delta has to be smaller than naught. So all they want to know is which of these is going to make delta be negative. Okay. Okay. So let's have a look at that. So do you agree that if I went... 20 plus 8 times minus 3. What do I end up with? I'd end up with 20 minus 24, which equals a negative 4. And the square root of a negative number is not true or not real. And therefore, we can say that that is so for k equals minus 3. We can have that this thing here has non real roots. Okay, so wherever you see the value roots and they start talking about real and non-real and that, think delta. Always think delta. 
Okay, now it says calculate the value of the sum of k equals 1 to 50, 100 minus 3k. So what do we have to do, grade 12s? We have to always, always, always find out if this is an AP or GP. And the only way we can do that is to do the first three values. So the first one is going to be for k equals 1, you've got 100 minus 3, which is 97. For k equals 2, we've got 100 minus 6, which is 94. For k equals 3, we've got 100 minus 9, which is 91. So the gap between 97 and 94 is 3, and the gap between 94 and 91 is 3. So it's definitely an AP. So now what we need to do is find the sum from of the n terms for equal to n over 2 bracket 2a plus n minus 1d. Okay, we need to find the value of this for k equals 1 to 50. So there are 50 terms. So it's 50 divided by 2. 2 times the first term, which is 97, 97, plus n minus 1 is going to be 49. And then the D is what? What is the common difference? It is 3. And it's actually a minus 3. Okay. So now all we have to do is put this in the calculator. So let's do that. We've got, I'm going to do the brackets first. I've got 2 times 97 equals minus bracket 49 times 3. I put the bracket minus underneath, outside, so I don't have to worry about it here. Close brackets equals. So therefore, we've got that this is 25 multiplied by, I'm sure that said 47, 47. So let's do that. So we're going to multiply this by 25. And that is 1,175. So this is equal to 1,175. So the sum from k equals 1 to 50 of this thing is 1,175. Okay, not too bad, eh? Right, quadratic sequences. Okay, so they tell us that t2 minus t1 is 7, t3 minus t2 is 13, and t4 minus t3 is 19. Okay, so let's think about this. We have the following, t1, t2, T3, okay? Then I say these two. T2 minus T1 gives you 7. T3 minus T2 gives you 13. And T4 minus T3 gives you 19. 19. Okay, so then do you agree we can get our second difference here? Yeah? 7 from 13 is 4. And no, it's not a 6. What the heck was I thinking? It is 6. And 19 from 30, 13 from 19 is 6 as well. So there you go. Now it says write down the value of T5 minus T4. So they want to know what it's going to be for T5 minus T4. Okay, so do you agree that this is going to be 6 every time? So therefore we can say that this is also going to go up by 6. And therefore this is going to be 25. So the correct answer is 25. Now they want T70 minus T69. Okay, so if we look at this, we actually need to realize that this is, we're looking at 7, 13, 19, 25. We're looking at a series here where this is T2 minus T1, this is T3 minus T2, this is T4 minus T5, and this is T5 minus T4. Okay, right. So do you agree that T2 minus T1 would be the first term, T3 minus T2 would be the second term, T4 minus T5, 3 is the third term and the fourth term. Okay. So those are the terms, the terms of it, okay, T, the terms. We know that the difference between them is always going to be 6, okay, fine. And they want T70 minus T69. So do you agree that term 1 is actually T2 minus T1, T2 is T3 minus T2, 
T3 is going to be T4 minus T3. Okay, so therefore T70 minus T69 is equal to the term, the 69th term of this series there, which is, okay, so it's T of 69 equals A plus N minus 1 D, where A is the first term, which in this case is 7. N minus 1 is going to be 68. And D is the common difference, the common difference, which is going to be 6. And we can therefore find the 69th term. Okay, grade 12s, I'm afraid we're going to have to love and leave you there at this point. We will carry on with this tomorrow, um, normal time. Have a wonderful day.